Okay, so it is truly an immense pleasure for me to introduce Phil Sharp to you today. Let me first tell you a few facts about Phil. He was an undergraduate at Union College in Kentucky. He earned his PhD in chemistry from the University of Illinois. And he then went to Caltech to do postdoctoral work with Norm Davidson at the time that electron microscopy was first being used to examine the structure of DNA molecules. Thereafter, he went to Cold Spring Harbor Lab where he was a staff member for several years. And in 1974, he went to MIT where he continues to be. So it was at MIT that he and his coworkers did the extremely elegant R-loop mapping analyses that uncovered the existence of introns in adenovirus free messenger RNAs. And as you know, those insights led to the Nobel Prize in 1993. So there are a couple of things that I ad have always admired very, very much about Phil. First is the creativity and the foresight that characterizes his science. He has invariably been on the cutting edge, the forefront of every new and exciting discovery in the field of gene expression. For instance, after the discovery of introns, uh, his lab identified the lariat structure that characterizes pre-mRNA uh, intermediates in the splicing reaction. Very, very beautiful mechanistic work on splicing. Concurrently, his lab was doing a lot of the basic work on understanding transcription initiation and its regulation in mammalian cells, including characterizing what a lot of the basal transcription factors do. A little bit later, many of the initial discoveries that have now led to a molecular understanding of alternative splicing came to his lab. And of course, all these things not only contributed to our understanding how cells work in general, but also very specifically to an understanding of viruses and cancer. And most recently, his lab has been seminal in doing experiments that lead to an understanding of microRNA function. And I'm hoping, I expect, that there's a good chance that he'll be talking about the next new frontier in his talk. Uh, second, many of the current leaders in the field of gene expression and RNA have been trained by Phil. Among them are Jim Manley, Tom Tushel, Bob Kingston, Steve Baratowski, Melissa Moore, Ben Plenko, Phil Zamor, and many others. So this is quite an impressive list. The impact is wide reaching. The third reason I admire Phil is that he has been an incredible citizen of science. He served on, in many advisory capacities and on many committees that have shaped the future direction of science. And this even includes neuroscience, as I think some of you might have guessed from the questions he was asking this morning. Um, moreover, he's been instrumental in putting novel scientific findings to practical use. So he was one of the scientific founders of Biogen and more recently of Anilin Pharmaceuticals, which has been successfully developing uh, therapeutics based on RNA interference. So Phil, we are very, much looking forward to your talk, and welcome to Yale. Thank you, Joan. It's a real honor to be invited to participate in this program, particularly in view of the outstanding talks we heard this morning and the outstanding speakers. I also need to thank uh, or congratulate Yale on medical school on its uh, 200th anniversary. Uh, we're celebra celebrating an anniversary at MIT this year. Uh, it is our 150th, so we're the new kids on the block. <laughs> and it's nice to come to one of the older institutions to learn something about science and particularly biological science, which is so extraordinarily developed here. And it's also an honor to have Joan Stites introduce me. Joan has been a remarkable leader in the field and citizen, and it's always an honor to share a meeting or a, uh, an event with Joan. I'm going to talk about the roles of RNA in gene regulation, but 
uh, I'm not even going to try to cover that topic. I'm going to talk about a couple of issues that are emerging that I find interesting, an, an interesting view. And um, I'm going to stress some of the, the newer uh, insights that we've been thinking about. But let's speak uh, generally, initially, about the role of RNA in gene regulation. I think this, well, this field is beginning to explode. It's exploding for a very simple reason. We now have a new set of tools to do deep RNA sequencing and to be able to then characterize at the level of less than one RNA per cell the nature of gene regulation and gene expression in specific cells. And this is going to lead us to a whole host of new insights as to the roles of RNA in the regulation of cells that we have not been able to study and see before. And it's going to profoundly change how we understand cell biology. Now, an example of this was the discovery of RNAi in 1998 by Farr and Mello, and that opened the whole field of RNA interference and the understanding that RNA can be a regulatory molecule, a very common regulatory molecule, in biological systems. And we know now that RNAi is keyed on double-strand RNA as a key signature for the initiation of these processes, that it, within cells, silences genes at a post-transcriptional level by cleavage of message, related processes silence genes at translation, and related processes silence genes at transcriptional stages. And this is particularly evident in pyRNA and controlling transposable elements, but I suspect that there are many other layers of regulation that will engage RNA in transcriptional control that we're just beginning to see the first hints of in our analysis of RNA populations. But over the last 10 years, this field has advanced enormously. And just a glimpse at one of the things that has emerged from the field is the ability to use RNA to actually silence any gene in mammalian cells or in most other organisms as well. And this is the ability to introduce a small interfering RNA that has a sequence complementary to a DNA gene and therefore neutralize the expression of messenger RNA from that gene in a cell. This gives us, by first designs, the ability to focus the inactivation of a gene and ask what is the biological function of that gene. And this has fundamentally changed how we do cell biology and how we can advance the field, and it's remarkable in its impact. But if you think about it, that most diseases are the products of specific genes. We treat diseases by inhibiting the activity of specific genes. We do that by making small molecules to enzymatic activities within the cell or making larger molecules or small molecules to receptors on the surface of the cell. And if you can actually treat specific genes by siRNA to silence them, we can have many of the same effects by a process in which you use RNA to silence a gene in a disease state. And this has led us to begin to develop, and I will not discuss it further, the abilities to introduce RNA within cells in, in the human body and, and in model organisms and probe the activity of genes and treat diseases potentially in, uh, in patients. And this is undergoing development, and I suspect and anticipate that in the emerging years in front of us, we will have a general approach to a new pharmaceutical activity through components such as RNA introduced into cells. However, the most common impact of the regulation of uh, genes by RNA that we know about to date is through the activity of microRNAs. These are RNAs that are encoded by the genome and are transcribed from our genome into hairpin RNAs that are then processed by drosha, an activity in the nucleus, and transported to the cytoplasm where a dicer activity here leads to the cleavage of the RNA precursor to an siRNA structure entering an argonaut complex. Now, half of all the genes in our cells are regulated by these small RNAs, typically by pairing and silencing through the activity of this RNA 
leading to translational inhibition and in many cases degradation of the message. Occasionally, these RNAs that are encoded by our genome as microRNAs can silence as well by complete complementarity. And in that case, Argonaut it cleaves the messenger RNA. So we now know that at least half of all the RNAs that are expressed in our cells as messenger RNAs, half of all our genes, are under control of a small RNA system expressed in each of our cells, differing between cells that control the expression of those messenger RNAs. Now, the specificity for that control was originally described by Ambrose and Rufkin in their initial discovery of LIN4 as a regulatory RNA for the activity of LIN14. And they identified by mutation that these sequences near the five prime end of the messenger RNA were the specificity for pairing to this messenger RNA and reducing its level of translation. And David Bartel, using bioinformatics analysis, generalized this model and identified these positions between two and eight as the key positions, called the seed region, for the specificity of the pairing between these small RNAs and messenger RNAs leading to their regulation. So what do we know about the extent and the nature of this type of regulation in mammalian cells now? We know that most of the target sites for regulation by microRNA are these seed interactions in the three prime UTR, that untranslated region at the end of the message, uh, there are some target sites within the reading frame of the message where it encodes protein, but those are much rarer than those specifying the three prime end. There is some evidence, less than 1% of all the interactions of microRNAs are through this type of center paired activity, but most of it, 99% appears to be through this type of activity. Most protein silencing due to microRNA regulation is about 1.5 fold to 2 fold. It is a very tuning type of regulation, and we'll come back to that later with one example of data. But if you have multiple target sites between a messenger RNA and a microRNA, you can get extensive regulation much greater than 10 fold. As I mentioned before, most of the regulation is through RNA degradation, but some uh, of it is also through translation. And this is a field that is uh, very unclear now, and that is a question as to how much engagement there is between microRNA and transcriptional activities in the nucleus of a cell. It is clear microRNAs can enter the nucleus and have pairing to messenger RNA or precursor to message, but does it have more extensive regulation at the level of gene expression? We know these RNAs play a critical role, both in normal processes, and you'll hear about that later, I'm sure, from David Baltimore and others, but they also have important roles in disease processes, and thus briefly discuss how microRNAs are thought to interact and engage the process of development of cancer. As you well know from the work of many in the field, and this is from an example of Weinberg and Hanahan in 2000, there are multiple pathways that, when deregulated, lead to changes in gene expression, cell proliferation, cell death, that are critical for the development of cancer. We now know from sequencing the human genome that there are tens to hundreds of mutations in most individual cancer cells, and every cancer cell differs somewhat from other cancers due to these mutations. And as you might expect, MicroRNAs are also critical parts of the pathways that control the development and the regulation of cancer. These microRNAs suppress pathways such as RAS, which Frank uh, Slack here uh, initially identified and has extensively studied, which controls changes in gene express expression and cell proliferation. There are microRNAs that control cell death, microRNAs that control proliferation, and signaling through other pathways that we know by mutation are absolutely critical for the activity of a cancer cell to become fully malignant and spread. We see these microRNAs acting in the two modes that we know protein coding genes also act in development of cancer. They can be drivers of cancer as oncogenes. 
NF kappa B amplification, NF kappa B dr uh, drives microRNA 155 that promotes the growth of cells. Amplification of 1792 is known in many human cancers, promoting the activity of cell growth and, and suppressing cell death. And microRNA 121, uh, IL 6, stimulates and contributes to other cancers. But the most common theme in microRNA regulation in cancer is the loss of activity in the cancer process. And this is illustrated here on this set in which there's a number of microRNAs listed here which are known to either be downregulated or lost in some cancers that contribute to prostate, lung, other types of cancer. They control cell death, cell growth, other signaling activities, DNA methylation, translational activities as well. So the general theme that one sees from looking at cancer cells is loss of activity is a contributor to the development of malignancy. So the question arises then, can a decrease in the regulation by a microRNA, uh, which is frequently observed in cancer, can this promote malignancy? And I want to briefly introduce the work of Manar Kumar, graduate student Tyler Jackson at MIT, who have used a mouse model to study this process. And what they did was to take a mouse model of lung cancer, or sarcoma here. This is the induction of sarcoma in a mouse model in which they have under conditional expression RAS, which when activated will promote cancer and found in about 80% of many can of cancers. P53, when flocks out, uh, will uh, delete P53. P53 protects us against cancer by monitoring the integrity of the genome. And DICER, the activity I mentioned before, that is critical for the expression of microRNAs. So if DICER is deleted in a cell, you would expect the cell would lose all microRNAs, lose regulation of a major portion of its activities at the level of cytoplasmic control. And what they determined is, and asked the question here, is how uh, significant is loss of microRNA in the development of cancer in this sarcoma model? So here is the black line. This is numbers of days. This is survival of animals. We're talking about 18 mice here. And what you see is that if you have wild type dicer, you get full microRNA activity and you get cancer in, a, in these animals about 200 days. Now, if you take one allele of dicer, making it a haplo uh, uh, allele, delete it out of induction of this flux activity, you get cancer then in about 100 days, a twofold acceleration in the rate of cancer. If you take both alleles under dicer, you actually delay the development of cancer. And all the cells that come out of this animal when typed for dicer are heterozygous, one deleted dicer allele, one uh, dicer present allele. So what this tells you is that a decrease by deletion of one allele of dicer accelerates the rate of cancer, loss of microactivity. You can characterize the level of microRNA activity. It is reduced approximately twofold. But if you ask in this in vivo setting for a cancer to develop in the absence of microRNA, you do not get cancers emerging from that uh, model. Now, if you look across, as Mano Kumar did, human sequencing data and ask how common is it in human tumors to see a mutation in one allele of the dicer gene, what you observe is through a large number of different types of cancer, a significant fraction of the dicer genes in those tumors is a hemizygous loss. So that means one allele is lost, the other allele is retained, microRNA loss in activity is correlating with the development of cancer in these models. So loss of microRNA control seems to relax the regulation system in these tumors to promote the growth and survival of cells in an in vivo model, but you do not see in this model and in the characterization of these tumors a total loss of dicer activity and a total loss of microRNA regulation. So that leads to a question as are microRNAs essential 
for cancer are essential for cell growth of somatic cells in uh, vertebrates. And if you ask that question, which we did by taking these mouse sarcoma cell lines from Kumar and Tyler and deleting the other allele of Dicer and creating cell lines that are totally devoid of wild-type Dicer activity. Now, when we do this by inducing the deletion of Dicer, half of all the cells that uh, come out of this grow quite nicely, so we're not selecting for a subset of cells. And what you observe is cell lines that grow for years at a time that have no microRNA regulation at all. So first lesson is that microRNA is not essential for the viability of somatic cells as it is not essential for the viability of embryonic stem cells, which was shown for a number of years ago. If you actually look at the microRNA population in those dicer deleted cell lines, that's along this axis here. Note this is a uh, logarithmic scale. Along this axis is reads from cloning of small RNAs out of the parental uh, haplodicer uh, cell line. What you see is a two log decrease in all the microRNAs that are expressed in those sarcoma cell lines. So you get a two log decrease. This is not a microRNA. It was misidentified. It's a snow RNA. You get a two log decrease in all the microRNAs in the dicer deletion cells, though these cells grow quite nicely and have a proliferative rate slightly slower than the dicer plus alleles. So the first thing, all this microRNA regulation is not essential for cell growth in cells and culture. Now you can ask the question, well, is it essential for the development of tumors in a certain challenge model? In this case, and this is one of several experiments, we've subcutaneously injected 25,000 cells of those dicer deletion types into a nude rag mounted mouse and waited for the development of cancer. If you have dicer plus with microRNAs, you see tumors in about 21 days that continue to develop over 46. But in the dicer minus, by 46 days, slightly slower, you actually see the development of tumors. You recover the tumors. They have the same pathology as those with microRNAs. And therefore, and you can clone cell lines back out of this and show that they do not have microRNAs. They have not recovered microRNA regulation. So what that tells us is that you can actually see a cell develop tumors in a challenge by subcutaneous infection, but you do not see tumors develop if you actually ask for the development de novo of a dicer deletion microRNA negative cell in vivo. Now the answer and the difference between those two settings is probably in the early stages of tumor development in vivo where hypoxia and other stress stresses the activated cell in ways that it has to then deal with to become a viable tumor. And the reason I argue this is that in every case in which we have derived cell lines that are del deleted in Dicer, we've done it in multiple examples, those cells turn out to be remarkably sensitive to stress. So in this case, in that mouse sarcoma cell system, here is the uh, cells uh, expressing activated caspase, oxidative stress, you see large amounts of cell death. Here's a mouse embryonic stem cell deleted in Dicer, genotoxic stress, you get massive induction of cell death, whereas those cells with microRNAs do not induce significant cell death. Telling you that microRNAs are important for dealing with stress in many settings, probably in the early stages of development of tumors, but microRNAs are not required for the growth of cells or the growth of cells even in a tumor state when you inject a significant number of cells. So I won't go through this, but I can uh, show you if in, in time that in embryonic stem cells, the pathways that induce cell death and arrest cell cycle are, many of them are under control of P53, and the predominant set of microRNAs in embryonic stem cells have been shown by us and many others to suppress the activity 
of cell death genes and genes that are uh, required for arrest of cell cycle under DNA damage. And therefore, loss of these microRNAs would explain why these cells are sensitive to stress. So if microRNAs are not required as a regulatory system in general for viability of cells, and you can develop tumors without microRNA regulation, though we know microRNA regulation is critical and can drive in certain settings the developments of tumors, how do we visualize microRNA regulation? And I think it's best visualized in the generality, not in the specifics, as providing a robustness to biological systems, a robustness that stabilizes cells in cell states, such as quiescent states, and microRNA that 7 is an important part of an example of that, suppressing RAS. It stabilizes differentiation by suppressing genes that are expressed in other cells and therefore maintains cells in differentiated states and maintains, uh, helps cells make transitions between differentiated states. And as I illustrated, it uh, allows the cells to uh, respond to changes in the environment, such as DNA damage and other activities, that otherwise would not be controlled adequately not to induce cell death. Let me show you an example of uh, just how a microRNA set confers or doesn't confer uh, the differentiated cell state. And in this exa example, we've taken a cell. This is the uh, mesenchymal stem cell, which uh, uh, is a... Uh, to a cell line that has been isolated by introduction of a large T antigen. It's a, uh, a gene that allows the cells to undergo immortalization. And we've done a microarray analysis on the genes expressed, and there's thousands of genes here expressed in this mesenchymal stem cell. And I'm compa comparing here the changes in that gene expression between that cell having dicer, two alleles of dicer, is a wild type, and those knocked out, totally devoid of microRNA regulation. So if you go from microRNA regulation to non-microRNA regulation, you see very little change. Same thing is true here of embryonic stem cells. Wild type, dicer plus with microRNAs, delete the microRNAs, very little change. Less than 2% of all genes change, and most of that change is less than 1.5-fold even that 2%. But if you go from that embryonic stem cells to mesenchymal stem cells, you get a dramatic change in gene expression. So this is the difference between microRNA regulation, and this is the difference between cell type regulation. So microRNA regulation contributes, even when you delete all of it, a, a small amount to the difference between different cell types, but it can be an important component in many sets. So uh, I conclude is that microRNAs can control the properties of cancer cells but are not essential for cell viability and not even essential for the growth of cancer type cells in an animal. MicroRNAs confer a robustness to cellular transitions and states, and microRNAs contribute a small fraction of regulation in stable cellular states, but they're absolutely central for many of the transitions between different cell states during differentiation and during the induction of stress act type activities. So they provide a buffer against changes in gene expression at transcriptional and other levels in that type of transition. Let me spend the rest of my time talking about a, another view of RNA in gene regulation that I find fascinating and can relate to a common interest between Joan and myself. And that is this issue here widespread transcription of genomes. And it has been reported here and many other places that if you look in mammalian cells in vivo and in vitro, you can find low levels of transcription of most of the genome, even though only 2% of it encodes messenger RNA and about 10 to 15% encodes the pre precursors to that message. What is all this transcription about? 
And we've been, we know that there's uh, transcription of genes that don't encode message, non-coding RNAs. They've been identified by chromatin modifications and arguments about conservation. Excess, hot air, and others have been studied, a few of them, but they do not come close to accounting for this general transcription. What we've been looking at over the last several years is a low abundance of non-coding RNAs associated with promoters and enhancers and I'd like to give you some comments on that because I think it leads to an interesting idea that may even be true. <laughs> so if we look at transcription, this is a model in which we understand transcriptional regulation now, where you form a complex with polymerase at promoter sites. You get escape from the promoter. The polymerase elongates over a short distance. It pauses. After it pauses, there's the activity of PTEF-B from the pause site releasing the polymerase for further elongation, and you get elongation across the gene. So pausing is a very common characteristic of expression of genes. Most promoters in many cells, 70 80% of them, have polymerase paused at the promoter site, and release from pausing is a significant point in regulation. But we were interested in this process when we did deep RNA sequencing of small RNAs out of an embryonic stem cell. And what we found by sequencing RNAs that were 18 to 30 nucleotides at a depth of 10 to 20, 30 million, 40 million RNAs per preparation, is that what we found were small RNAs on a metagene plot that would correlate with the site of initiation of transcription, the transcriptional start site for the sense gene, which would then be in this direction and is coded here in red. But we also saw a set of RNAs that come from the transcriptional start site, peaking up, down, upstream in negative direction, about 250 nucleotides, and we had no idea what this was about. This we could expect from pause polymerase, giving you small RNAs. This we did not expect as an antisense transcript, and we saw this for the vast majority of the promoters in these cells. When we started comparing that data to other data from Rick Young and other labs who have done polymerase localization experiments, where they've used an antibody to chip out polymerase II in these cells after fixing it to the DNA, and doing forward and reverse reads, what you observe is that there's a polymerase paused in the sense direction, and that's that peak there, and it generates two peaks, but there's a second polymerase upstream. We know transcription modifies the chromatin by H3K4 methylation. You see H3 methylation in the sense direction, this peak, but you also see it in this peak. So polymerase is there as well as modifications of chromatin. So 70% of all transcriptional start sites exhibit what we call divergent transcription, two polymerases going in the opposite direction. These are enriched in CBG island transcription start sites, and Paul's polymerase and, and chromatin modifications confirm the polymerase is there in generating these small RNAs, or could be generating these small RNAs. So we've gone on to characterize that antisense transcript from a subset of genes because I wanted to know in detail what was the nature of the process going on in the antisense direction. So what we've learned, and I'll briefly summarize that and tell you where I think it uh, will take us. So here's a gene, I'll use it as an example, but we've done this for several others. Here's the polymerase peaks on that gene, and you see a sense polymerase. This is the sense transcript here. The polymerase is paused above it. Here's a chromatin modification consistent with the elongation of the polymerase. Here's where we found the antisense RNAs as short RNAs. And when we characterize the RNAs coming from this region by very sensitive 5' primaries and 3' primaries, we find these small RNAs are downstream of caps sites of initiation of the polymerase, and the RNAs can extend several thousand nucleotides in the antisense direction. There's a family of different links, not any unique length, spanning from 50 out to 1,000. 
So these polymerases are undergoing elongation. Summary of that is that the antisense RNAs are capped. The antisense RNAs range from 50 to thousands of nucleotides. And the steady state level of these antisense transcripts is one to four copies per cell. I will recall for you that there's only two copies of DNA per cell. So there is, if these are nascent RNAs, there's RNA with the polymerase engaged in both of those antisense directions on both copies of that gene. Now the next question is, well, is it paused? And is, is the antisense transcript under the same regulation by PTAP-B as the one in the sense direction? And here is a, an easy way uh, to test that. We, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, pause is, site escape is mediated by PTAP-B. It is due to negative regulatory factors, NEF and DSIF. And PTAP-B is a kinase, phosphorylates all three polymerase and these two activities, releasing the polymerase for elongation. But we've known for many years that there's a set of small molecules, drugs, that inhibit this kinase activity called flavopurinol and a number of others. And the question was, do you see inhibition of the antisense transcript if you inhibit the PTAP-B activity? And here's an example of that for four different genes. Note here, this is a 60-minute treatment. This is spliced RNA, nascent RNA, and upstream antisense RNA. This is the antisense transcript. This is the nascent sense transcript. This is the spliced RNA in the cytoplasm. And with inhibition, you'd see no change in the spliced RNA levels, normalized to one, which is consistent with a 60-minute inhibition. It's a very stable population. However, nascent RNA in the sense direction, very sensitive to flavopurinol, drops to about 5% within 60 minutes. Antisense RNA from all four genes drops five or more fold within 60 minutes saying that that polymerase going in the antisense direction is actually dynamic. It is depending on PTAF-B for its elongation. If you inhibit it, it goes away within 60 minutes. You can look at the kinetics. This is, again, the antisense transcript versus the nascent RNA. And here you see a decrease over 60 minutes, one minute inhibition, 30 and 60. Wash it out. It comes right back within 30 minutes. So these RNAs appear back in the cell. Uh, the polymerase in the antisense direction is engaged in making RNA. In the sense direction, you see the same activities. So that tells us in this divergent transcription that the antisense transcription uh, is elongation of uh, antisense RNAs require the activity of PTAF-B and the CDK9 kinase. The synthesis of the antisense is dynamic has a half-life shortly, slightly longer than that of the nascent RNA in the sense direction. And I would, didn't show you the evidence, but exosome, which is a nuclease known to control RNAs that are in the nucleus of the cell, it targets the antisense transcript for degradation, at least in part there might be other degraded pathways. So this gives us a picture of transcription, not only in embryonic stem cells, but I should say in other cells as as John Liss showed it with us initially in a parallel publication, and by many others in other cell types, that many promoters, and the majority of promoters in some cells, have a sense polymerase going in the sense direction and an antisense polymerase going in the antisense direction, both under control of activities through the initiation complex and elongation beyond PTAF-B, giving you Two polymerases divergently transcribed. Now, I won't show you the data. It's actually being developed now. But in cells, there are 20,000 enhancer type sequences. These are DNA sequences recognized by transcription factors that drive the transcription of genes that are nearby. And I can assure you that a large fraction of the enhancers in embryonic stem cells and in neuronal cells have divergent RNA coming from them as well. Polymerase is generating RNA in both directions. This was first recognized by Greenberg in the neuronal system of FOS activation and FOS enhancers, a paper in Science a year ago. And now we've looked at it in embryonic stem cells, and the evidence 
is pretty clear. That it is also driving RNA transcription in both directions. So we have now a large number of sites in cells from promoter sites and from enhancer sites in which you get divergent transcription. So what role could it have? The, it could facilitate nucleosome-free regions. Polymerases are little motors that move in two directions so they can expose DNA sequences. It can provide signals in the form of nascent RNA to target RNA binding proteins to promoters and enhancers. And it can provide a platform for looping type interactions through these types of proteins or other activities between promoters and enhancers that are well described in the nucleus of mammalian cells. But what explains the instability of the antisense transcripts? Why, if these RNA polymerases are undergoing transcription through DNA sequences with caps and other activities, why are they terminating and what uh, accounts for the uh, low abundance and instability of the RNAs from those antisense transcripts and from enhancer driven RNAs. And I think the answer to that is going to get, play into an emerging theme in our understanding of gene expression in cells. And in the last few moments, let me uh, explain what I'm thinking here. And the antisense transcripts and the enhancer transcripts are probably unstable because they do not have the coupling of transcription and splicing. And that signaling between transcription and splicing accounts for uh, productive transcription in the sense direction and the lack of it in the antisense direction. So there's several recent papers that illustrate the coupling of transcription elongation with splicing. Gene Beggs, in a very nice paper, showed that splicing-dependent RNA polymerase pauses in yeast where there are splicing signals within genes, showing a communication between splicing signals and polymerase elongation. Gideon Dreyfus reported in a very nice paper that U1, which is a component of the splicing complex, promotes precursor RNA from premature cleavage. I'll illustrate that in a moment in polydenylation. And Blinko and others reported that splicing and chromatin modifications are in communication with one another throughout the body of the gene. Let's take an example here of Gideon Dreyfus's insights. What he showed in the expression of genes in mammalian cells is that within the sequences of the gene, there are these sequences that could be read as polydenylation signals. If U1 is recognizing through RNA sequence complementarity the precursor RNA, it suppresses this polydenylation reaction within a gene, allowing the polymerase to elongate. Without U1, you get cleavage and termination. So in the absence of U1, for example, the polymerase would proceed here, make this, cleavage would occur, you'd get an RNA with poly A on it, and you get termination of elongation, this would be degraded. So this shows that elongation by polymerase is coupled to splicing recognition. Now, that's a much more extensive model than that if you synthesize what's available in the literature. So what looks like is happening is there's an extensive coupling of transcription and RNA splicing throughout the body of genes that are expressed and making sense messenger RNAs. And this is, I won't take you through this in detail, but this is the way I would conceptualize it and others have conceptualized it, in which there is a transcriptional start site where polymerase initiates. You get communication between PTAF-B as a kinase, which phosphorylates these factors, also facilitate, is facilitated by recognition of chromatin. The polymerase moves away, PTAF-B, TATS, specific factors, Many others, U1 and U2, begin to interact. They are associated with activities that are uh, recognizing chromatin modifications. H3K4 trimethylation has been shown here. Fact, a, a nucleosome opening factor, and then the complete spliceosome forms, giving you productive transcription and coupling to splicing. And this coupling between splicing, transcription, and activities allow the polymerase to elongate 
throughout the body of the gene, and I would propose that in the antisense direction, this communication is probably not there. So that leads to the last conjecture, and that is the coupling of elongation, splicing, and polydenylation signaling suggests that only genomic regions and coding sets of RNA processing sequences would be transcribed efficiently into rapidly processed RNA as mRNA after splicing transported to the cytoplasm, introns are degraded. And perhaps, and this is totally conjecture now, perhaps RNAs transcribed from other regions, such as the antisense and from enhancers, generate signals due through their degradative pathway that can be read back to the chromatin to indicate that these do not encode sense signals, but encode sequences that don't have the coordinated recognition for splicing and therefore silence the chromatin activity. If that's true, it gives us a way of integrating the information necessary for the expression of genes into the transcriptional expression process, and I would not be surprised if that does not turn out to be correct. So what I've tried to give you is an overview of uh, regulation by RNAs focusing on microRNAs as the most common example and showing that this is a very extensive system that doesn't, that confers at least in stable cell types a robustness to the cell and give you some picture of what I suspect is the emerging I relationship between the coupling of gene expression, gene structure, and elongation by polymerase. Thank you. <laughs>